Welcome to Direct Talk. Parkinson's disease is increasingly common as people live longer lives. It now affects one in 500 and the fastest growth is in Asia. Dr. Tilo Kunas is one of the world's leading stem cell researchers. He's based at the Center for Regenerative Medicine at Edinburgh University, where he and his colleagues are working to find a cure for the disease. Dr. Kunas says stem cells holds the key and cell replacement trials on patients with Parkinson's are likely to take place in the very near future. We know a lot about Parkinson's that good treatments will be with us soon. And like cancer, I think Parkinson's will be cured step by step. Parkinson's is a very complicated condition and what actually triggers it is not very well understood. But once Parkinson's starts, the way it progresses is getting to be understood at a very high uh, level of detail, at a very molecular level. So, for example, we know that a small protein called alpha-synuclein is misfolding and traveling through the brain and causing all sorts of problems once Parkinson's has started. There are many different symptoms of Parkinson's. The most common is involuntary shaking of parts of the body, such as the hands or feet. It's almost as if I've forgotten how to walk. I go from day to day trying to change different things in my walk to improve it. Occasionally I might hit on something that I think is the answer. So Parkinson's usually manifests itself uh, to individuals as a motor problem. Problems with uh, walking, um, freezing of, of feet, handwriting uh, also becomes a problem. But as we know more about the condition, there are a lot of earlier symptoms of Parkinson's that are less well known and also um, less analyzed. So for example, constipation is an early sign of Parkinson's. Loss of sense of smell is an early sign of Parkinson's. Too much production of sebum, which is the oil on the skin, is an early sign of Parkinson's. Parkinson's and dementia do have similarities, but they have a number of differences as well. So, um, for example, Alzheimer's is not usually associated with motor problems, but Parkinson's can have uh, dementia. So um, a fairly um, high percentage of Parkinson's uh, patients um, will progress to dementia in the very late stages of the condition. Parkinson's mostly affects older people. There are currently 8 to 10 million people around the world with the disease. The incidence of Parkinson's is very similar across the globe and is highly dependent on the, um, the longevity of a population. So Western countries, uh, such as uh, uh, countries in Europe and in Japan, they do have an, an incidence that is, is very similar because they have uh, a long-lived uh, population. So the incidence is about 1% of people over 65, and that doesn't change in, in different countries and has not been changing um, due to modern living. So one thing Parkinson's isn't, isn't, isn't a, a, a byproduct of the modern lifestyle. And there is a, a, a gender bias. So Parkinson's usually affects men more than women. And the only country that it's not the case is Japan. In Japan, for some reason, um, women get Parkinson's more uh, frequently than men. So I don't think it's exactly clear why right now. It could be something to do with genetics or it could be um, lifestyle, not, not sure yet. The Scottish Centre for Regenerative Medicine at Edinburgh University is one of the world's leading laboratories for stem cell research. Tilo Kunath's work is playing a key role in forthcoming clinical trials that, if successful, could transform the lives of people with Parkinson's. When Kunath first came to Scotland from Canada, his main focus was embryology. I grew up just outside of Toronto, and I was always interested in maths and science in school. I finished uh, an undergraduate in biochemistry, um, I did a master's in Montreal, but then I got really interested in embryology. I really wanted to understand how a single egg, fertilized egg, it's very simple, it's one cell, 
can develop into a fully fledged human or a fully fledged mouse is what I was working on. And then came to Edinburgh in 2003 and there I was just trying to understand how a stem cell, a pluripotent stem cell could make a neuron, a primitive neural tissue. Just that one step. So it was very basic science, trying to understand the signaling, understand the molecules. And that's when I started working on Parkinson's. I realized that all of this background I had, all this scientific background, could be applied to tackling uh, this condition. The director of the centre, when Tilo Kunath joined, was the eminent embryologist, Professor Ian Wilmot, best known for leading the research team that successfully cloned a mammal, a sheep named Dolly from an adult cell. Ian is an inspiration, right? So cloning Dolly the sheep was a very a magical time. I remember I was in Montreal when I first heard about it, but you know, I absolutely didn't think this was possible. So uh, he's certainly uh, a scientific celebrity in my eyes, even though you know, his office is just a few doors from mine. And he's, yeah, he's just been a very supportive, uh, kind man. And it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to, to chat with Ian, to discuss ideas uh, with Ian. Professor Wilmot announced in 2017 that he'd been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Cambridge. I have to say, you know, seeing him and working with him, it, it was clear probably over the last year that something was not quite right. His movement wasn't quite right. So um, it wasn't absolutely a surprise when he um, was diagnosed and, and he, he told people. How have you been doing since you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's? The thing which really persuaded us that there was something wrong was I was out walking one day just before Christmas and it, it almost felt as if my feet were stuck to the floor and it was really quite difficult to, to walk. Mm. Extraordinary feeling. Mm. Uh, within a day or two when I'd had um, medication prescribed, just, just a single pill mm. produced a quite p profound effect, which is a big relief. Wilmot has recently started a new exercise regime, which includes Pilates. So I understand you're doing Pilates now, and how is yes. that uh, going? That helps. I mean, I find it very hard. Uh, some, some of the things, I, mean, I find that I, I can no longer stand on one leg, for example. You know, okay. I, I guess I used to be able to do that, like, uh, yeah. and there's some things. And, and some, of the, some of the maneuvers that they do involve several steps. Um, and se doing several different things at the same time. You know the classic thing of, of doing this. It's equivalent to that, that you have mm. to concentrate. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Since Dolly, stem cell research has been transformed by the discovery that adult cells can be made to behave like cells taken from embryos. These induced pluripotent stem cells have provided a major breakthrough for Parkinson's research. It was a Japanese scientist, Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Kunath and Yamanaka are in regular contact. So I first met Shinya Yamanaka in 2003 in Edinburgh, and we were both working on similar problems, uh, trying to understand the early embryo. And I, I wasn't uh, aware he was, he was about to go on to to discover one of the most uh, uh, exciting things in biology. These are the now famous iPS cells that uh, he um, discovered in uh, Kyoto. And this is a, a, a very new type of stem cell that has properties that we knew about, it had properties of embryonic stem cells, but he didn't require an embryo to make them. So he was using a skin biopsy or blood, for example. So any part of an adult cell could do, and then as the name implies, the, he induced a property on these cells that doesn't exist in, in adults, but does exist in the early embryo. Building on Yamanaka's discovery, Kunath soon began to work on iPS cells derived from Parkinson's patients. His research has been part funded by Parkinson's charities ever since. I didn't really start working on Parkinson's until 2007, 2008. There was an opportunity to make iPS cells from people with genetic Parkinson's. And a student and I made these iPS cells in 2009, 2010, and then the rest was history. So suddenly we have these beautiful tools, iPS cells with a Parkinson's mutation to do lots of work uh, on in the lab.
In patients with Parkinson's, cells in the brain that usually produce dopamine become damaged and stop producing the chemical which the brain needs to send messages that control movement. Researchers are working on a cell replacement therapy which, if successful, will enable these damaged cells to be replaced by ones that can produce dopamine. Parkinson's patients lose neurons that make dopamine and in the lab we can make these dopamine producing neurons from iPS cells very efficiently. So we can make lots of them. So the other thing about iPS cells is that they're immortal. So when you make them from a patient, you have unlimited amounts. And now we have Parkinson's neurons in the lab that we can do lots of experiments, drug testing, understanding what's wrong with these neurons. And the patient themselves have only donated a blood sample. So this has just been transformative for the way that we try to understand disease and will also be transformative in the way that we treat disease. A major focus of Kunath's own research is this cell replacement therapy. He's working with clinical teams in other countries to provide them with iPS cells that can be used in the first cell transplant trials on patients with Parkinson's. We are looking at cell transplantation therapies in my lab. We are looking at the process of quality control for making them in the lab. We're looking at the genetics of uh, the different cell lines that we have imported. And we're also addressing some of the issues with cell therapy. We know that uh, cells that are transplanted into a Parkinson's patient will eventually also get Parkinson's. So the disease process hasn't been halted. You've just added some new neurons and they will function for a considerable amount of time, um, but they will also then get the disease. So one of the big projects in my lab is to make the neurons disease resistant. Kunath's team regularly collaborates with researchers around the world. The value of international collaboration cannot be underestimated. And even our institute here, if you walk around, you'll, you'll see that an, an institute such as ours is very international. So we'll, we'll get um, you know, researchers from all over the globe, including from Europe. And you know, we are a bit worried about how Brexit will affect that. But um, uh, the international collaborators are have, you know, we just go and work with the best people and we don't you know, really view uh, borders at all, right? So my collaborations in Japan have been extremely fruitful. I can give you uh, some of this. Kunath also works closely with patients who have Parkinson's. He believes that early diagnosis will become much more important in the future. Early diagnosis for Parkinson's is, is a hot area of research. People are, are working hard on this. At the moment, um, early diagnosis is not going to be that helpful because the drugs that slow Parkinson's are not quite there yet. But as soon as drugs are available that slow and stop Parkinson's, early diagnosis is going to be crucial. So you can imagine being diagnosed with Parkinson's before there are any serious symptoms before there are um, problems with movement, even pre-Parkinson's. I think Parkinson's will be able to be diagnosed before there is any clinical symptoms. That's very exciting. And then imagine then you can intervene with a drug that stops the progression. And when these two things happen together, you'll prevent someone from clinically getting Parkinson's. These type of drugs are not available yet. They are in clinical trials, but you can imagine if someone has an early stage of Parkinson's, and is given this type of drug, we could halt it in its steps. The truth is that what really motivates me is, is a lot of the interactions I've been having with patients, I have to admit. A lot of the research that we do is very much in isolation. And I think when we start listening to the patient, we really get to understand what their needs are and that should and guide our research. Right. So um, I've only started doing this and you know, one of the projects in my lab is really due to listening to someone with Parkinson's. And I think if that is uh, more uh, uh, common, I think a lot of the clinician scientists and the basic scientists will guide their research to, in a more uh, meaningful and useful way.